Almost every conspiracy theory that people had about Twitter turned out to be true. This viral comment was made by Elon Musk after the first Twitter files were released last December. Since that time, 16 more Twitter files have been released, and they've revealed a concerning relationship between government and big tech, which is likely to evolve as online censorship laws come into force. Today, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the Twitter files, including why they're being released, who's been releasing them, what they say, and how the people in power will push back. Let's start with a bit of background. As most of you will know, Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk finalized his acquisition of Twitter in October last year. In the months leading up to the acquisition, Elon promised that he would bring more transparency to the social media platform with the aim of increasing trust. In November, he delivered. He tweeted, quote, The Twitter files on free speech suppression soon to be published on Twitter itself. The public deserves to know what really happened. In December, the first set of Twitter files were released in a thread by American author and journalist Matt Taibbi. Naturally, the first set of Twitter files explained exactly what they are and also discussed the now infamous suppression of a story about President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, leading up to the 2020 election. For now, let's focus on the first part. What are the Twitter files and why are they significant? In short, the Twitter files are a collection of internal documents at Twitter which basically prove that the US government was working closely with the social media platform to censor certain information. This is significant because in the United States, free speech is protected under the First Amendment. Now, to be clear, Twitter is a private company, meaning that it is under no obligation to abide by the First Amendment. However, the US government is obliged to abide by the First Amendment. Its use of Twitter to suppress free speech could therefore be illegal, according to some constitutional experts. Another reason why the Twitter files are significant is that they suggest the US government could be engaging in censorship on other social media platforms. If you watched our video about social media censorship, you'll know there's evidence to support this hypothesis. The Twitter files add to the pile. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, there have been 17 sets of Twitter files so far, and they've been posted as lengthy threads by multiple journalists. Besides Matt Taibbi, the list includes Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss, Lee Fang, David Zweig, and Alex Berenson, all of whom are well respected. But of course, they've all since become de facto enemies of the state for being involved in this. Now, it's important to point out that the Twitter files aren't just sitting there waiting to be reported on. In an interview with Kim Iverson, David revealed that even though they have unrestricted access to Twitter data, thanks to Elon, it's been very difficult to dig up the information they're looking for. This is in part because Twitter systems weren't designed to be searched. It's like they have access to the entire internet, but no Google to search through it. The difficulty is also due in part to the obstruction and sabotage that the journalists have faced from Twitter employees, most of whom have been fired. The silver lining is that it's been easy for them to know when they found something. In an interview with Joe Rogan, Matt gave an amusing example of this. A document containing phone numbers for a secret social media censorship group chat for big tech companies was titled Secret Phone Numbers. There's OPSEC for you. And with that background in mind, let's dig in. You'll recall that the first set of Twitter files talked about the suppression of a story about Hunter Biden. I'll start by saying that both political parties were involved in social media censorship as was almost every single branch of the US government, particularly the intelligence agencies. The difference seems to be that Republican-affiliated entities suppressed the discussion of specific subjects, namely panic buying at grocery stores at the start of the pandemic. By contrast, Democrat-affiliated entities suppressed specific people and even specific tweets. Make of that what you will. Anyways, the TLDR with the Hunter Biden story is that he left a laptop at a computer repair shop 
containing information which suggested that his old man was doing shady stuff. The story was published by the New York Post in October 2020, shortly before the November 2020 election. The story was suppressed by Twitter and other social media outlets, apparently at the requests of Democrat interests. Many Republicans have since argued that the 2020 election outcome would have been different were it not for the censorship of the story. But, well, I guess we'll never know. Now, the second set of Twitter files was published a few days after the first. The topic was Twitter's secret blacklisting policy, also known as shadow banning. For context, Twitter executives had denied for years that the platform shadow banned users and would never do so for political purposes. Lo and behold, the second set of Twitter files confirmed that Twitter did have a shadow banning system in place designed to limit the reach of specified users. This suppression was almost always political. It also went into overdrive during the pandemic, with those skeptical of pandemic restrictions being targeted. The third set of Twitter files was apparently published on the same day as the second. The topic was the controversial removal of then US President Donald Trump from the platform. This was also the topic for the fourth and fifth sets of Twitter files, so I'll lump them all together for the sake of simplicity. For starters, Twitter's top staff worked tirelessly to suppress Trump's reach on Twitter. Following the contentious events of the 6th of January, Twitter's top staff essentially came up with a new content policy to justify banning Trump. The files seem to imply that they were pushed to do this by Democrat interests. This involved axing Twitter's public interest policy, which stated that information, no matter how controversial, should remain on the platform so long as it's not illegal. The public interest policy was replaced by a new policy called the glorification of violence policy with Trump as the first offender. As explained by Matt in that aforementioned Joe Rogan interview, the glorification of violence policy includes an assessment of who follows a person on Twitter to determine whether that person incited violence. So, if even a single account deemed to be violent follows Trump, it means he was violating the policy. If you think that's justified, take a second to consider that almost every account on Twitter probably has at least one follower that Twitter could consider to be violent. In other words, the policy could theoretically be applied to whichever accounts Twitter wants to get rid of, which is pretty scary. Anywho, the sixth set of Twitter files is where things get even scarier. They revealed that Twitter was in such frequent contact with the FBI that the social media company could be considered a subsidiary of the intelligence agency. The FBI provided hundreds of takedown requests and Twitter always complied. Not only that, but the number of former FBI agents working at Twitter was so large that they'd created their own Slack channel. For reference, Slack is a platform that's used to coordinate workplace communications. Much of the sensitive info in the Twitter files came from these Slack discussions. These files also revealed that Twitter complied with censorship requests from NGOs. Matt's conclusion was that, quote, what most people think of as the deep state is really a tangled collaboration of state agencies, private contractors, and NGOs. The lines become so blurred as to be meaningless. Now, the seventh set of Twitter files return to the topic of the suppressed Hunter Biden story. This is because the independent journalists discovered that both Twitter and the FBI were aware of the fact that the contents of the laptop were likely genuine, but insisted that it was Russian disinformation. The eighth set of Twitter files were about another scary subject, and that's how Twitter helped the US military execute propaganda operations overseas. They shaped narratives about foreign conflicts that put the US in a positive light and even used fake accounts with AI-generated deepfakes to this end. Now, deepfakes are no joke, and it looks like the powers that be will use them as an excuse to require KYC to use social media. You can learn more about that by watching our video about deepfakes using the link in the description. I digress. The ninth set of Twitter files were about Twitter's relationship to all the other US government agencies. This set of Twitter files seems to have been a response to the FBI's own response to the previous set of files, which the feds predictably claimed 
were all a conspiracy theory to discredit the agency. Funnily enough, the Twitter files found that the FBI acted as a sort of doorman between Twitter and other US government agencies, allowing them all to submit content takedown requests and whatever else. This included censorship of discussions about atrocities related to the war in Ukraine. You can guess why. What's wild is that the long list of US government agencies included local police departments, which had the power to search and censor users and posts. These privileges were presumably granted by all the big tech companies involved in online censorship meetings, including Facebook, Microsoft, and even Reddit. Now, the tenth set of Twitter files are about a touchy topic, so you'll forgive me for speaking somewhat in code. As you might have guessed, the topic is the pandemic, which we're still technically in. These Twitter files found that true information was suppressed and censored if it went against the official pandemic narrative. The instructions for this suppression came directly from the White House, both under former President Trump and current President Biden. Whereas the Trump White House asked Twitter to censor specific pandemic narratives, the Biden White House asked Twitter to censor specific people and posts. That list of people included former New York Times journalist Alex Berenson and Dr. Martin Kuldorf, an epidemiologist at Harvard Medical School. The list of posts included those which cited official government statistics or statements about the pandemic which discredited the official narrative, what they call the science. Anyways, the 11th set of Twitter files explains the history of the social media platform's partnership with intelligence agencies. This set of files suggests this collusion only began in 2017, when Democrat interests insisted that Trump had won the 2016 election due to Russian interference. It appears that there is no evidence of any significant Russian interference in the 2016 election, at least according to the Twitter files. Rather, Russian interference was used by US government agencies as an excuse to further infiltrate big tech companies and dictate how information is shared online. This ties into the 12th set of Twitter files, which suggest that Twitter was coerced into complying with the US government. This is because they would have politicians push for anti-big tech legislation and leak information to the press whenever Twitter refused to comply with their censorship requests. This combination of private and public pressure intensified when the pandemic began. US government agencies pressured Twitter to suppress information about the origins of the pandemic. The US government has since pulled a complete 180, with the FBI confirming original suspicions were indeed correct. The 13th set of Twitter files came from Alex himself, and they discuss how debate about a particular pandemic treatment was suppressed by Twitter. Obviously, I can't go into the details about this topic here, but I'll leave a link to the full thread in the description, along with all the Twitter files. Now, to put things into perspective, the first 13 Twitter files were released within a 30-day period, specifically between the beginning of December and the beginning of January. The most recent files have been more spread apart, probably because most of the damning info has already been found. In any case, the 14th set of Twitter files were released in mid-January. They reveal how trending hashtags on Twitter, which went against popular narratives, were attributed to Russian bot farms and suppressed, despite Twitter having zero internal evidence that there was any Russian involvement. Some of you might remember that Russian bots were being blamed for, well, just about everything a few years ago. The 14th set of Twitter files recounts how this baseless claim became overblown to the point that mainstream media was alleging that Russian bots were controlling both sides of the narrative. This relates to the 15th set of Twitter files, which reveals that intelligence agencies started alleging that large Republican-leaning accounts were being run by, you guessed it, Russian bots. These allegations were so extreme that even Twitter's censorship policy teams were pushing back against suppression requests. In mid-February, Matt published the 16th set of Twitter files and provided a nice summary of the previous 15. Quote, The Twitter files have revealed a lot. Thousands of moderation requests from every corner of government, feds mistaking both conservatives and leftists for fictional Russians, even Twitter deciding on paper to cede moderation authority 
to the US intelligence community. I must have missed that detail. Anyhow, Matt goes on to lament that there's been next to no mainstream media coverage of the Twitter files, save for the fact that Donald Trump had requested Twitter take down a mean tweet. Ironic. Matt then highlighted a few more egregious cases of such requests to see if the media would cover them. All he got was crickets. Now, the 17th set of Twitter files was published earlier this month. They revealed that the US government used Twitter for geopolitical purposes with agencies instructing the social media platform to suppress and censor posts and accounts assumed to be associated with foreign intelligence. Similarly to the obsession with Russian bots, hundreds if not thousands of accounts were incorrectly labelled as being associated with Indian or Chinese intelligence. Now, I for one would like to see how foreign intelligence agencies have been using Twitter because I have a feeling there is some truth to this story. I suppose we'll find out in subsequent Twitter files releases, though it's unclear if and when any more will be published. The final Twitter files thread reveals that the bombshell reports have managed to attract the attention of US politicians, who have summoned two of the journalists to a hearing. The hearing will be taking place on Thursday the 9th of March, so be sure to keep your eyes peeled for that. I have a feeling it's going to be very, very interesting. While you wait, you can check out our video about all the online censorship laws being rolled out around the world using the link in the description. So, this brings me to the big question, and that's how the people in power will push back against the Twitter files. This is a bit of a trick question because the answer is they've been pushing back the entire time. One of the main ways they've been doing this is by going after Elon's other enterprises. Tesla has been hit with a barrage of baseless lawsuits and regulatory threats, and the FDA recently refused to allow Neuralink to implant chips in people's brains. Targeting Elon's other enterprises makes sense because that's where most of his wealth comes from, and he used that wealth to acquire Twitter. Twitter has also been the target of a relentless propaganda campaign claiming its fresh free speech approach is destroying the world in every possible way. That is a little unfair, if you ask me, considering that Twitter and all other social media platforms have been making the world a nastier place since long before Elon got involved. Anyway, most of this propaganda has come out of the European Union, which will begin enforcing its online censorship laws this summer. I suspect that the pressure on Elon and Twitter will only increase as we get closer to the 2024 election in the United States. It's clear that Twitter has significant influence on political discourse in the USA. What's said on the platform could influence the outcome of the next election, which gives Elon lots of power. Considering that he voted Republican for the first time last year, it's likely that he will be promoting whichever candidate is selected to run Team Red. Considering that most US agencies seem to be aligned with the Democrats, it's likely they will do everything they can to prevent a Republican victory. This begs the question of how exactly they're going to take down Twitter. After all, Elon is a pretty formidable foe. He's one of the richest men in the world, has lots of connections, and has a massive loyal following. He also has access to cutting-edge technologies thanks to all the companies he owns and operates. And therein lies the answer, cutting-edge technologies. If I were to put my tinfoil hat on, I would say that it's plausible that US agencies could attempt to take down Twitter by flooding it with deepfakes or images related to elections. This could provide them with the perfect excuse to go back to Twitter saying that they're not taking content moderation seriously. I mean, US agencies already have a history of doing this. Recall the eighth set of Twitter files. Luckily, Elon is a smart guy and probably saw this coming from a million miles away. I don't think it's a coincidence that the paid verification badges make it easy to identify which accounts are malicious. This will make it easy for Twitter to scrub most, if not all, the deepfake content prior to the 2024 election. The caveat is that it could simultaneously require everyone using Twitter to complete KYC to use the platform. At that point, all the US government agencies would need to do is find some way of removing Elon from Twitter and installing someone who will use this information for their own agenda. Make no mistake, 
This is a takeover we could see with almost every single social media platform. The only solution to this takeover is to develop decentralized alternatives, which is exactly what former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey is doing now. This transition from centralized to decentralized would be bullish for the cryptocurrency blockchains that support decentralized social media platforms such as Aave's Lens Protocol. More about that in the description. And with all that said, folks, thank you all so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and I will see you next time.